Last time, William Wallace and the Scottish forces rewrote history by destroying the English castle and emerging victorious at the Battle of Falkirk. Despite a small little accident at the Battle of Stirling, the Scots defended their homeland, their freedom, and their pacifism. Now we head east to Mongolia for our final Age of Kings campaign, Genghis Khan. A blue wolf took as his spouse a fallow doe. They settled at the head of the Onan River to raise their offspring, and there were born the Mongols. This campaign will be quite the challenge to do as a pacifist. First, we have the Taichus and the Naiman, who each want to defeat the other tribe. Then there's Kushluk, and oh boy, everyone has been asking about Kushluk. He's a hero unit who has to die, so how can we kill him without killing him? Then there's the Jin, who build a wonder, the Persian Shah, whom we're supposed to assassinate, and the army of King Wenceslas, which can't be smashed against our castles if the castles would kill his soldiers. And then finally, there's a single bridge across the frozen Sajur River. To get across this bridge, we need to deal with the Hungarian siege. Remember those hero trebuchets back with the Saladin campaign that couldn't be converted? Well, without redemption, now every piece of siege is a hero trebuchet. So, with all occasions formed against us, will Genghis Khan be able to complete his campaign of world conquest without killing even a single enemy unit? Let's find out. We begin by uniting the Mongol tribes under the banner of Genghis Khan. Behold, the horde of Genghis Khan approaches. You men, you will visit each of the outlying tribes. You must convince as many as you can to join our glorious army. But beware the Karakitai, they are without honor. Genghis Khan tasks us with visiting the tribes and convincing them to join his glorious army. First, we visit the Ungarads, who endeavor us with collecting a relic. The Karyids have some monks, so we pay them a visit. They want us to collect 20 sheep. The most obvious sheep pen is guarded by the honorless Karakitai, but we can avoid them entirely just by traveling around the map and collecting the free sheep. Thank you, Great Khan. We will honor our word by providing you with these soldiers. Now that we have a monk, we'll need a relic. There are four wolves who guard a relic in the northeastern part of the map. But the scenario designers strike again. In the definitive edition, this relic is not present on hard difficulty. Instead, we'll need to steal a relic from the Karakitai. They have a monastery in the western part of the map. We'll use our light cavalry to lure away the defenders while we destroy the monastery and grab the relic. Here's a useful mechanic. A unit maintains its attack stance when converted. If we set a soldier to no attack stance, then it will just stand around and do nothing after being converted, and we simply can convert it back. Bringing the relic to the Ungarads, their Mangudai join our horde. You have done well in bringing us this artifact. We will ride with the Great Khan. Next, we journey to the Uyghurs, who ask us to kill the legendary Orin Lu the Wolf. We proceed carefully up the precarious passageway to the lair of the Great Wolf. The skeletons of his victims litter the ground upon which we ride. At the top, we come face to face with the beast. He's more aggressive than his brethren, and his hunger and lust are his undoing. He chases us away, aggressing down the slope where our riders can take a hill advantage and use the high ground to finish him off. Yes. Yes, that is the pelt of the Great Wolf. We will join you, Genghis Khan, and to seal the agreement, we will give you the gift of flaming arrows. That leaves the Taichuds and the Naiman, who are at war with each other. We need to defeat one of them for the other to join us, and that means converting their units. The Taichuds have light cavalry with conversion resistance, so let's change our diplomacy stance with the Naiman. We can lure out their cavalry archers, tank the damage with other units, and convert them with our monks. Now, all that's left is to head over to the Taichuds. You have done well. We will ride with you. 
Four Mongol tribes now followed the banner of Genghis Khan. The rest of the world will soon know true fear. An easy start to this campaign. We just avoid the Karakitai and let our monks do the rest. Now, onto a life of revenge. And everyone has been asking, how are we going to deal with Kushluk? Well, for starters, it's very easy to complete this scenario by killing only one unit. We just attack this watchtower with a couple of light cavalry to draw out the honorless Karakitai army. As they chase us around, we sneak into their base, destroy a single tile of palisade wall, and charge in to take out Kushluk. But one kill is not zero kills, so we need to ask ourselves, can we do better? Kushluk doesn't train any mangonels, and scorpions don't inflict friendly fire damage, so we can't shabate other units into killing Kushluk for us. All other players are allied with Kushluk, so we can't garrison another TC and use that to fire on him. There aren't any wolves or other dangerous animals on this map. I guess we must have just scared them all off when we killed Ornlu in the previous scenario. The AI script requires Kushluk to be killed before he resigns, so we can't trick them into resigning by, say, converting all of Kushluk's other units and destroying his buildings. So, there's no way to kill Kushluk without actually killing Kushluk, right? Well, in the Saladin campaign, I went back to the Conqueror's expansion. But that's not far back enough. This time, we'll head back to the Age of Kings. All of the Windows 10 compatible patches I know of work only for the Conqueror's expansion. So welcome to my Windows XP VM. You might recognize the desktop background because it's used as the background for the building menu icons in the Definitive Edition. Anyway, the point of using the Age of Kings is that heroes can be converted. We'll just build up a large number of monks, convert Kushluk, and then delete him. It's Genghis Khan. We must flee. <laughs> Such is the vengeance of the great Khan. There is only one problem. If we build up a base to construct monasteries, we're going to need to take over the Taichud village. But to do that, we need to kill five cavalry archers. Please don't hurt us. We can aid in your blood feud. There's no wolves or any way around killing them. They have to die for us to take over the village. Now, you might be thinking, this is worse. Five lives clearly is more than one life. Shouldn't we just kill Kushluk by himself and not concern ourselves with the Tai Chus or with old Microsoft products? Well, let me ask you, would you not sacrifice five Frankish knights in order to save Joan of Arc? What's more valuable, one hero unit or five generic units? It's not a straightforward decision. What we have here is a trolley problem. Do we follow our light cavalry's prompting and head straight for the Tai Chud village, or do we divert from the intended path and instead use our speedrunning skills to head straight for Kushluk? Now, I'm no expert in morality. I'm just a pacifist. I'll leave this question open for you to decide. Which should we prefer? Killing five cavalry archers or killing one Kushluk? Next, we head into China. The Great Wall separates us from the Shi Xia, Tenguts, and Song, while the Jin base themselves on an island across the water. We have 40 minutes before the Jin start building their wonder, and we'll need to move quickly. We capture a transport ship, sail around the engineers, and capture some villagers. The Mangonel can be sacrificed so our villagers can make an escape. One of them builds a dock and some houses, while the rest come back to our starting location to build a base. As we get our town center and dock up and running, we transport a scout behind the Great Wall. We bring back the battering ram to deal with the nearby tower, while using our scout to capture the bombard cannons. We use them to take out the gates and keeps of the Great Wall. This gateway is the only passage through the wall, and the AI never deletes segments of the wall to pass through. With only this one passage, we can use the Great Wall against the Chinese, and we send some villagers to fat slob up this passageway. The Tengutes eventually train some siege rams, so these walls won't keep us safe forever, but they will slow down the enemy long enough to allow us to get a strong boom. Keeping our bombard cannons on the opposite side of the wall, 
we gradually take out the remaining keeps, but more importantly, we can send a sneak attack towards the Shi Shia. Their AI script doesn't rebuild their castle. If we take it out, we end their production of true konus. We move in with a quick attack with the bombard cannons, but the true konus are angry and they come down off their mountain fortress to revenge themselves upon our cannons. But we're prepared with a transport ship, allowing us to pick up our bombard cannons and make a clean getaway, fleeing to safety. Reaching the Imperial Age, we make some cannon galleons and monks, but our enemies are breaking through and the Jin are constructing their wonder. We dismantle their coastal defenses with our cannon galleons, destroying their guard towers and castles. Just like the Shi Shia, the Jin don't rebuild their castles. Raising them grinds the Chukonu production to a halt. The Jin AI script also trains gunpowder units, but the Chinese don't have access to gunpowder, so the only production remaining are the cavaliers from their stable. But that's not enough to stop us as we run in and kill the wonder with a charge of our own cavaliers. With the wonder out of the way, all the pressure is off, and we can take as long as we like to win the scenario. And yes, indeed, we're going to take our time. The Jin train at most 12 cavaliers, but we can take advantage of the no attack stance trick by letting them convert our cavaliers. Eventually, we leave them with 12 useless cavaliers who just stand around idle. We convert the rest of their true canoes while the cavaliers look on, frozen in place. Then we can convert their monk, move in to destroy their buildings, and head forward to convert their villagers. The Jin, like all the AI scripts in this scenario, resign when they have no town center and fewer than four villagers. It takes a good deal of time converting, but after a while, we defeat the Jin. Crucially, the Jin do not delete their market. The other players don't make any navy, so we're completely safe on the Jin's island. We build some markets in the corner, set up a trade route, and collect enough resources that we can research spies. Now no one can hide from Genghis Khan. The rest of the scenario involves using monks to convert the remaining enemy villagers until they resign. The enemies try to run around the map, so we make clever uses of walls to trap them in. Some of their forces remain attacking our original base, but we can again wall up the passageway through the Great Wall, this time trapping these units on the other side. It takes a long time to hunt down every last villager of green, cyan, and red, but eventually, we finish converting enough of them that they delete their units and resign. This scenario isn't particularly difficult, it's just incredibly long. Hunting down the villages at the end is essentially a campaign in itself. But we succeed in getting zero kills, so the time and the struggle is worth it. As the Horde rides west, the next scenario splits the map into two battlefields. In the north, Subutai and some friendly wolves must deal with the Kipchaks and the Russians. In the south, the Mongols must deal with the great city of Samarkand, led by the Persian Shah. There's an assassination plan for the Shah, with champions concealed within trade carts. The trade carts may be empty now, but don't worry, there's definitely champions hidden there. Somehow. If the Shah survives, then some scenario triggers make the Persians much stronger. But killing the Shah is not necessary for defeating the Persians. The only condition for defeating them is to destroy their wonder and their two castles. The Kipchaks are easy to deal with, we can just ignore them until we have some monks then convert their units after they resign to capture their buildings. The real challenge, though, comes from the Russians. They resign if they have no castle, and strictly fewer than four military units. But if given time, they trade exactly four battering rams. If we leave them time alone to boom up, then we will never be able to defeat them. We don't have redemption, so we can't convert these rams. And even if the Russians lose all of their other units and buildings, they still don't resign as long as they have these four rams. We have to move out to harass the Russians, while at the same time dealing with the Persians. 
We can't walk any military units into the Persian base, but we can walk villagers into it. As long as we avoid the areas that would trigger the Persians to get angry, we can construct buildings and then train military units inside of the Persian walls. In the north, we distract the Russians with some of our cavalry archers while sneaking a villager to lame their gold mine by walling in their mining camp. They can't train rams they don't have any gold income. Our economy is tight, but manageable, and we can use the lessons we learned from our Barbarossa pacifist run to build siege workshops and mangonel down the Persian castles and wonder. We're on a timer as the Persians get wise to our plans and turn on us after 13 minutes and 20 seconds. But with proper economy management, we can produce just enough mangonels to take out their buildings in time. They'll delete their army and their economy and keep deleting until they are defeated. But they don't delete their market. As pacifists, we repurpose our assassins, allowing them to live a peaceful life as trade carts. Now we turn our attention towards Russia. The Russians train lots and lots and lots of long swordsmen, so using rams to kill their buildings won't be an option. Instead, we have to rely on knights and eventually cavaliers. We focus down their siege workshop first so they won't produce any rams. Then we go for the town center and the castle, as they don't collect stone to rebuild them. Spies costs only 4,000 gold, so we can research it again to see their line of sight. Our monks slowly whittle down their villagers until they have none left. Without any villagers, they can't rebuild their barracks. Finally, we raise these buildings and end the tide of long swordsmen. Now, we gradually convert their remaining army until they have so few units left that they resign. Overall, this mission isn't too bad, but the lack of any decent upgrades on our monks makes dealing with the Russians quite the puzzle. And with those zero kills, the Mongols have done a great job of bringing pacifism to the region. Let's see how things are going. The governors of outlying cities were executed by pouring molten silver into their eyes and throats. Oh, um, let's go to the next part of the story. Separate mountains were made of the skulls of men, women, children, horses, dogs, and cats. Oh, right. That seems very, um, pacifist-like. Yeah, let's just move on. In The Promise, we play a game of capture the flag. We don't need to defeat or even fight our opponents. All we have to do is run to their bases and stand near their flags with a single unit. Polish flag captured! The Polish flag is trivial to capture, and the German flag is a simple follow-up. With a bit of coaxing to get through their gate, we head inside and grab the flag. German flag captured. There's a monk and some cavalry on a nearby mountain, so we'll head over and grab them. We have been stuck on this mountain for 15 years. So show us the way down and we will gladly join your army. The main challenge is the army of King Wenceslas. The scenario objectives are to build three castles and have a huge fight against this large army in the middle of the map. But we can't risk our castles killing the Bohemian soldiers. Instead, we need to lure them out and sneak into their flag. There's a layer of fortified wall protecting their flag, so we need three petards to break it down. We need another three for getting through the outer walls, and we'll also train a few extra, in case some are killed. Once we're in position, we trigger the Bohemian army to march forward. The task object effect moves them to the center of the map, so they ignore us as we head to their base. But the Bohemians are anything but defenseless. There's a pair of dangerous sea jonagers perched atop the cliffs. We need all of our dodging and split micro skills to give our petards a path to the gates. We blow them open and head inside. A bit of dancing with our cavalry distracts the remaining units and keeps our petards safe to blow a final hole in this inner wall. We run in, grab the flag, and finish the scenario. Bohemian flag capture! All three flags captured! We are victorious! This one is pretty straightforward. All we need is a plan to deal with Wenceslas, and then grabbing his flag is easy. We now turn our attention to the west. 
the Western powers are weak, having dealt with decades of suffering zero casualties during the Crusades. Our final test is a 1v1 showdown with Hungary at a single bridge crossing the frozen Sajer River. Replacing the old Teuton civilization, the Magyars train a dangerous army of siege units and Magyar hussars. We have 40 minutes until Subutai arrives with reinforcements, but even with his help, how will we be able to hold out against units that can't be converted? Immediately at the start, we have to deal with one of our worst nightmares, a single unit that tries to suicide itself into our tower fire. There's a light cavalry that starts the scenario being tasked towards our base. We wait until it starts attacking our towers, then we delete them. The cavalry unit then stays around attacking the palisade walls instead of running into our base. Next, this scenario gifts us with some unique saboteur units. Just get us close enough to an enemy building, and we will give our lives for the cause. Unlike standard petards, these saboteurs do a great deal of splash damage to enemy units. The main Hungarian army doesn't charge until 6 minutes and 20 seconds, so let's try to use these saboteurs before the attack starts. We'll just take out some of these towers across the bridge, making life easier for our future selves. Now we start booming up on two town centers while erecting as many walls as we can construct in a short time. In the original game, we could just wall off the end of the bridge, but the scenario designers strike at us one last time, as the terrain near the bridge is no longer suitable for walls. Instead, we have to build massive fortified walls stretching across the front of our base. The Hungarians train a few cap ramps and trebuchets, so they inevitably will push through these walls, but we must stall them for as long as we can. Their army focuses almost exclusively on our main base, we slip out the side, where the riches of the eastern region's gold and stone mines beckon to us. For the most part, the Hungarians ignore us, allowing us to build up our economy in peace. We rely on walls instead of army, hence we can head straight to our max 125 population by training villagers. Occasionally, a few units come towards our eastern base, but a couple of soldiers from our starting forces are sufficient to jebait these Hungarians and lure them away. To defeat our enemy and achieve our final victory, we must destroy their town centers and castles. We build up an army of fully upgraded cavaliers and siege rams. Now we just need to wait for the opportune moment to strike. The Magyar Hussars have an attack bonus versus siege rams and will rip them to shreds if given the opportunity. We need to ensure that their army cannot return to attack the rear of our assault force. After 40 minutes of hiding behind walls, Subutai arrives. Subutai and his men have arrived in the east. His reinforcements are rather useless at this point. We hide these saboteurs and hunting wolves in the side of our base, so they don't kill anything while we're not looking. But it's time to launch our final push. We lead our cavaliers and our siege rams across the Sajo River Bridge, and just in time, as the Hungarians have a surprise waiting for us. The Hungarians are trying to blow up the Sajo River Bridge! But their plan backfires, as now their army is trapped on our side of the river. We're free to run throughout their base, forcing our pacifism upon the unwilling Hungarians. Castles crumble before our Ferrari rams, as their army can do nothing but stand on the other side of the river and wish this were the HD edition so they could glitch themselves across. As the final buildings fall, we complete the campaign of Genghis Khan. Such is the fate of the Hungarians and all who would oppose the tribes of Mongolia. There we go, zero kills on the final scenario. That's it for the original Age of Kings campaigns. We have 11 kills at the Battle of Sailing, and either 1 or 5 in A Life of Revenge. I'll be taking a short break from these pacifist videos for a couple of weeks, then I'll start up again with the campaigns of the Conqueror's Expansion. As a final note, we've grown quite a bit over this past month. I'm glad you all enjoyed these pacifist videos as much as I do, and thanks to everyone who takes the time to leave a comment. I read through as many as YouTube is willing to show me, and I give each of them a heart. Thank you all very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.